is a tropical paradise, the island of Kauai. I live on a secluded beach surrounded by palm trees and turquoise waters. Most people dream of vacationing in an island paradise like Kauai. But there's trouble in paradise. We are being told that global temperatures are increasing, polar ice shelves are melting, and sea levels around the world are rising. All around the island there is evidence of coastal erosion from storm surf. The shoulders of this road circling Honolulu Bay are falling into the sea. Our beaches are disappearing. This palm tree, whose roots were once firmly planted in the ground, will soon vanish into the sea. Wanting to know if there is a relationship between our rising sea levels in Hawaii and the melting ice shelves in Antarctica, I went there. I traveled to the southernmost town in the world, Ushuaia in South America, and boarded the Russian research vessel Grigory Mikheyev to set out on a voyage of discovery. This is the Southern Ocean, called the Roaring Forties and the Furious Fifties by sailors of yesterday, referring to its stormy latitudes. Our ice strengthened steel hulled 66 meter ship weighing 2,000 tons is pitched and rolled like a tinker toy in the angry seas. Screeching winds reach 60 miles an hour and the seas rise to 30 feet. The bridge is the best place to be in extreme sea conditions, focusing on the horizon to keep seasickness at bay. By the second day of our journey, the air temperature changes. It's cooler and crisper. We are told that we have crossed the biological barrier of the Antarctic Convergence, or the polar front, where the cold Antarctic surface waters sink beneath the warmer waters of the subantarctic, causing an upwelling of nutrients and minerals. We are now in the Southern Ocean and officially in Antarctica. At last, the seas abate and the winds calm. We sight land. I am surprised to see land, having imagined it would all be snow and ice. But unlike the Arctic, which is made up of floating sea ice that waxes and wanes with the seasons, Antarctica is a true continent, the fifth largest continent in the world. That evening, the full moon rises over the South Shetland Islands. It is our first night in Antarctica, and we are full of anticipation to step foot on land the next morning. This is Uli Carlson, our expedition leader from Sweden. I ask Uli why he returns to Antarctica each summer to educate scientists and visitors about this vast continent. I have kept coming back for the simple reason that I fell in love. Uh, it is an unearthly place, pristine, it has a lot of creation. Uh, it's untouched in so many ways, in ways that you wouldn't find anywhere else in the world. Man has never evolved here. There has been no wars. There is no industries, no communities. It is very much a land on its own. And I guess that it's what really makes you feel humble, small, and happy to be allowed visiting in the short Antarctic summer. This is Mike Murphy from England, our guide and lecturer, who has been to Antarctica over 75 times. I don't know what it is that draws us all back here. When I was first asked to come down here in 1984, I couldn't believe anyone would actually want to come down here. I thought, ice and cold seas, what is there to see? It's uh, everything we've always tried to escape from. And it was not till I actually came down here the first time 
and step foot on the continent and that, I, I just, I was blown away. Uli chimes in. It's the wildlife, of course, uh, that has adapted to harsh conditions. Uh, the nice penguins, the beautiful seabirds, the seals and the whales that we find down here. All of it is a lure, has an attraction that makes you want to come back. Mike agrees. I've never seen wildlife. I never thought it existed like it did down here. And the wildlife is so, it's so free, it's not nervous, there's no uh, natural uh, mankind predators at all. Um, the only predators the penguins really have down here are, are leopard seals, the odd um, killer whale. But when we first stepped on land and we walked amongst these penguins, none, none of the animals are nervous of us. It's just a, an incredible feeling. And of course, the snow-capped mountains, the glaciers, I mean, it's uh, every year, every trip you come down here, the sun is, in a, is shining stronger or, or, or it's cloudier. Or it, it, every day it looks different. You can come to the same place a hundred times and it'll look different every time you take a photograph of it. It's, it's never ending and it will always be that way. Those of us who have never been to Antarctica before are surprised to learn that the continent is volcanically active. We take the zodiacs ashore to Deception Island, where volcanic ash and stone cover the black sand beach. Steam rising from the geothermally heated water along the shoreline gives testament to the most recent volcanic eruption in 1970. We also learn that Deception was once the base for Norwegian whaling operations and that thousands of whales were slaughtered here in Whalers Bay just for their blubber. Welcome to Deception and uh, I will be around here telling you for instance about how 5,000 whales in the peak years were towed in through Neptune's bellows and processed here in the uh, factory. And they took care of only the blubber, so they pushed out the carcasses in the water here, and the whole caldera was full of dead whales. These whale bones are a relic. Today, all of Antarctica is a whale sanctuary. Unfortunately, some whaling countries still slaughter whales for so-called scientific purposes. Our next land excursion is Nico Harbor, located on the continent of Antarctica. Uli wants to hike up the glacier, but cautions us that it may be too warm and therefore too dangerous. We will have a walk up and around the corner. Those of you who feel like going up, looking at the penguins, and come up a little bit on the glacier. You have a wonderful view from up there. We will see what the glacier is like today, because if it's frozen and very slippery, it's no good walk. Then we will just stay with the penguins. Uli's intuition about the glacier is true. Mike points out a barely visible crevice that is really quite deep, and we end our hike, taking in the view while Mike explains to us how an iceberg is born. What happens with these, all this glacial stuff? It snows and snows and snows, and the snow lands on the top, and then more snow and more snow. And it gets heavy and heavy, and then it forces its way down until it comes to the uh, sea. And then more snow behind it forces it out, so it starts to push it out in the sea, and it floats. But then it gets to a certain point where it breaks off, and then that's what causes the, uh, the icebergs. And so we go back to the beach and watch the penguins, and what a sight. Baby chicks chasing their moms for food. Mother penguins feed their young by regurgitating food they have already eaten. But these chicks are as big as their moms who are tired of feeding them.
Finally, the mother penguin gives in to her chick and stops running away. A mother's job is never done. But here comes trouble. Mom says, I don't mind feeding one of you, but two is too many. Meanwhile, the boys are hanging at the beach, swimming, sunbathing, preening, and primping. Amazing. The next day, our Russian captain, Alexei, navigates our ship through a spectacular seven-mile-long, one-mile-wide sea pass that separates Booth Island from the continent. We arrive at the Russian research station, Vernansky. Although no country owns Antarctica, 27 countries have established research stations under the Antarctic Treaty. The Russian team is here to study ozone, temperature rise, and other planetary conditions. Our expedition arrived on this station one year ago, in January last year, and we hope come back to Ukraine in March this year. And now we have uh, non-stopping quality uh, scientist data. Uh, it's ozone data, 50 years, ionospheric data, 50 years, meteorological data, 60 years. Um, our uh, Antarctic Peninsula is uh, very warm. Just a short boat trip away is Wordy House, so, one of the welcome. original research stations in Antarctica. Uh, this is exactly the forerunner of the station you just visited. So this is the early station. You have several months of total darkness uh, and then small glimpses of sun. But you have things, you have kind of, you know, different kinds of chess, you have a radio, I don't know if that works, but look here, oh, nice. the nostalgia, 78 RPM, his master's voice. <laughs> I think maybe the most important thing, if you th consider wintering here, is a focus, mm. you have to have something to work with every day, mm. and secondly, you have to be friends. Mm. First of all, you have to be a good friend with yourself. Mm. If you have something to hide or some, <laughs> something you are suppressing, don't stay in a hut like this in Antarctica over winter. Back on the Zodiacs, we maneuver through a spectacle of sculpted ice. Uli talks about the ice and why we need it to survive. 90% of the ice in the world is in Antarctica. And I have seen over the years in the peninsula how much of it is going at a faster and faster rate. I can see new land coming out, I can see glaciers retreating, and in the last few years there has been first more snow, and then now, this last season, in the spring in November, very little snow. And it has melted away in a way I've never seen before. Many places that still had snow cover uh, for the whole season, now are drained totally of it. A new landscape is coming forward. And it is of concern, of course, because this is part of a trend that we have all over the world. All over the world, apart from one area in East Antarctica, where we actually have a cooling but that is the only place, and maybe it's luckily right there, because we need the ice of East Antarctica. If that was to melt, sea level would rise by 60 meters. But we see a big change in West Antarctica. 50 years of uh, climate records shows an increase in mean annual average temperature of 2.5 degrees Celsius. Uh, that is a very pronounced warming. 
There are areas now in Western Antarctica, the peninsula, where you don't have the sea ice building up any longer. And if it doesn't build up sea ice, there will be no krill. And krill is the staple diet food of the penguins, the seabirds, the whales. So the krill lives under the sea ice in the winter and grazes algae that bloom on the surface, on the surface of the ice. If there's no ice, the krill won't be there. We next visit Peterman Island, home to about 800 pairs of gentoo penguins. So there is ice in other parts of Antarctica and so far I think that the penguins will not suffer greatly. And you can see that the chin straps and the gentoo penguins, two other species, they are doing well because they are much more open water penguins and fish feeders. I thought we were supposed to be walking on snow today. Well, nobody told you that you were, but usually at this time of the year you have about a meter more snow than right now, which is a bit of concern, but again, area has increased by 2.5 degrees the last 50 years. Wow. 2.5 degrees in a snow and ice area is a lot. So I think that is exactly what we see. The trend is here, the warming is here and uh, luckily it's not in East Antarctica where you have the only cooling place almost on the planet right now. We head back to the Grigory Makiev over slush, snow, and barren rock. What we see when we reach the shore astounds us. During our brief one-hour visit to Peterman Island, the sea had filled with ice. We pass a leopard seal, the tiger shark of Antarctica. A powerful predator who feeds on seals and penguins, he's even attacked divers here. We carefully negotiate the ice and through the skillful maneuvering of our Zodiac captains, we reach the safety of our ship. As we do before and after each land excursion every day, we disinfect our boots so alien species are not inadvertently brought onto the land or carried to another part of the land. <laughs> Captain Alexei cautiously navigates our ship back through Le Maire Pass. I have a feeling that all of the ice in the channel came from a newly calved glacier. While most of the passengers and crew stay below in the galley, my new friends and I wait outside on the deck to see where all of this ice is coming from. And we don't have to wait long. This footage shows the breaking glacier at one half its normal speed. I think that the warming in Antarctica does not really have a big threat uh, on a short term for the wildlife. We can see in the peninsula area that daily penguin colonies are decreasing. Uh, the population is decreasing. 
But I think it's rather a question of redistribution. There is ice in other parts of Antarctica and so far I think that the penguins will not suffer greatly. And you can see that the chin straps and the gentoo penguins, two other species, they are doing well because they are much more open water penguins and fish feeders. This global warming or climatic change, it is taking an impact and, and we can see evidence down here, both down here and up in the Arctic. Most glaciers, I would say 90%, maybe even 95% of glaciers, are receding. Receding to the point that certainly up in the Arctic, the ships can't even get close enough to the tongue of the glacier because 50 years ago when the charts were, were made, these tongues of the glacier were, were, uh, were forward by more than two miles. Now we have two miles of uncharted water to reach the tongue of the glacier. I mean, it's receding two miles in 50 years. That's a horrendous speed. Despite the alarming facts about the ice, we are still mesmerized by its beauty. And one of the most memorable sights we see in Antarctica is a rookery of penguins all alone on one massive iceberg. As we approach, some of the gang decides to go for a swim. But of course Antarctica can be maybe protected in itself, but it's part of the world. And if climate changes, it certainly changes in Antarctica too. And that will of course affect Antarctica. Also, all our activities in the north, in the industrialized countries, are mirrored in the eyes of Antarctica. Because it is one planet, it is one ocean, it is one atmosphere and everything that we do in the north will be easily detected in the south. For instance, when we burnt a lot of lead fuel, leaded gasoline, the lead levels in the snowfall in Antarctica increased dramatically. Once they stopped leaded fuel, it sank again. So it's one system, what we do to the earth, that will show up in Antarctica. As visitors to Antarctica I think we can do not a lot but we can at, as human beings in our home communities try and fight for renewable energy, better programs for recycling, certainly taking care of much more and I think really we may have to a little bit alter our lifestyles I can see no reason to have cars that emit enormous amounts of uh, carbon dioxide or uh, other emissions when there are possibilities to buy cars that don't. We have a lot of issues here and there are a lot of possibilities to actually act, put pressure on, lobby, uh, as long as you take this to your heart and take an interest, take a standpoint, I'm sure that there will be a movement that can carry us far to create a better world. As we leave this majestic place like no other on the planet, we spot our last iceberg. It's like a spaceship that approaches us from the deep waters of the Drake Strait. 
Even Captain Alexei, who has traveled everywhere in the polar regions, has never seen anything like it and navigates the Grigory Makiev 360 degrees around the entire circumference of this monolith. We all know from grade school that the ice on the water is only the tip of the iceberg. 90% of the iceberg is below the surface. What appears to be two monuments of ice is actually one massive iceberg connected under the surface of the water. We are awestruck by the sight. I think that visiting Antarctica, seeing the beauty of the land, also being educated on the facts that are there, the warming in the peninsula, the melting of the ice, the rising sea level, I think that is raising awareness. It is creating a mind that is open for concerns and willing to try and help. We want to create ambassadors for Antarctica, but not only for Antarctica, because Antarctica is part of the planet. We have one home, and that is our planet Earth. And if we don't take care of it, which we seem to be pretty bad at right now, uh, then we may lose our home. So I think Antarctica can play a great positive role in raising awareness and feel for the beauty of our planet. As our ship sails away, Uli tells us about the Antarctic Treaty, the United Nations document that rules the politics of this continent, and how we now have a 50-year moratorium that bans mining, oil drilling, and mineral exploitation in Antarctica. What happens next is up to us. They said, we can have a 50 years moratorium. And the treaty party said, oh no, well, come on, no, no. What do we have today? A 50 years moratorium. <laughs> so that is also to tell you that everybody can influence things. If you have an idea that is good, you feel for it, you may be able to actually improve the world change the world to the better. For Antarctica! Antarctica. Back home on Kauai, I am filled with gratitude that we can live in such a beautiful place. But I know we must each take personal responsibility for what is happening to our planet, including the melting ice shelves in Antarctica and the sea level rise at home. If a house is on fire, we don't ask ourselves why. We take action. Our planet is warming and it's time to take action by taking responsibility and doing our small part to make a difference for future generations.